Central Asia is dying of thirst. Little waterlogged droughts and farmers are forced to migrate. To solve this crisis, the Soviet Union sent thousands of workers to dig and drill a well about 584 feet deep, then lowered a massive piece of equipment into it. Their goal was to create a giant lake. A few days later, the hole was full of water. They even dreamed of building 40 artificial lakes for daily life industry and fish farming. But the truth is they made a mistake right from the very first step, creating one of the worst disasters in Kazakhstan's history. 60 years have passed and this wound still hasn't healed. So what exactly did they do and what was the real cost? Today, let's find out. Do you remember, right after World War II, we entered the Cold War? The world wasn't divided by oceans, but by ideology. At that time, power wasn't just about who had more tanks, but about who owned the scariest weapon, the nuclear bomb. The United States led the way. In 1945, two atomic bombs were dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. The Soviet Union didn't want to be left behind. Just four years later, in the Semipalatinsk region of Kazakhstan, the Soviets responded with their first nuclear test called RDS-1. Even though it wasn't more powerful than America's atomic bombs, the Soviets made it clear to the world the U.S. no longer had a monopoly on nuclear weapons. But the Soviet Union didn't want to be seen as a country that only knew how to destroy. They wanted to show that the atom could serve humanity. So on May 16, 1950, Stalin signed the Atoms for Peace Decree. Basically, this allowed research institutes to find ways to use nuclear energy, to generate electricity, provide heating, and even reshape nature. They actually did it. In 1954, the small town of Obninsk became home to the world's first nuclear power plant, able to supply electricity to more than 5,000 American homes. At that time, Soviets chanted the slogan, a peaceful atom in every home. But they didn't stop at generating electricity. The Soviets wanted to go further using nuclear bombs to reshape nature. Sounds crazy, right? Or maybe impossible. Radiation is no joke, so safety became a must for the entire program. In 1965, they launched the Nuclear Explosions for the National Economy Program, which was almost a copy of America's 1957 Project Plowshare. The program was personally approved by Khrushchev and assigned to the Kurchatov Institute, the Soviet Union's largest nuclear research center. So engineers began searching for a remote area. They finally chose the dry riverbed of the Chagin River in the barren grasslands of Kazakhstan, about 80 miles from the city of Sami. There were no houses, no people a perfect choice for safety. But perfect here was only relative. The engineering was extremely precise. They drilled a hole about 584 feet deep, about the height of a 50-story building. The explosive device was placed in a tube 10 feet long and 3 feet in diameter. Every measurement had to be exact. Down to the inch, even a small mistake could spread radiation far and wide. After months of stressful preparation, everything was ready. On that fateful morning at exactly 5.59 and 59 seconds in the morning, Greenwich Mean Time, a very specific moment on January 15, 1965, hundreds of scientists, engineers, and soldiers held their breath waiting for that second. A military truck slowly entered the test area carrying the nuclear warhead. Everyone retreated to a safe distance. On the control screen, the countdown began. 10, 9, 8, 1. A flash of light and the ground shook violently. In the first two and a half seconds, a super hot plasma cloud erupted, reaching temperatures of tens of millions of degrees Celsius, hotter than the core of the sun. After five minutes, the smoke column reached 15,750 feet, nearly half the height of Mount Everest. The explosion had the power of 170 kilotons of TNT, eight times stronger than the Hiroshima bomb in 1945. About 10.3 million tons of earth equal to 1,000 Empire State buildings were blasted into the air. 
the blast was so loud that seismic monitoring stations as far away as Mongolia recorded it. When the smoke cleared, a giant crater appeared 410 feet wide and 328 feet deep. To help you picture it, that's about as tall as a 30-story building and big enough to swallow a whole American football field. Around it, the earth was melted into glass and the ground was still smoldering. Few could have guessed that this blast crater would soon become a nuclear lake, unlike any other on Earth. Fifty days after the explosion, when the radioactive dust had settled a bit, hundreds of engineers and soldiers estimated between 180 and 300 people began working in the minus 4 degrees Fahrenheit cold of the Kazakh steppe. They used bulldozers, excavators, and even regular explosives to dig a small canal linking the crater to the Chagan River, racing against the March flood season. When the last dam was broken, water from the Chagan River rushed in at over 528,000 gallons per minute, enough to fill eight Olympic swimming pools in just 60 seconds. In just three days, the first reservoir reached 792 million gallons. And a few days later, that number shot up to over 2 billion gallons, enough to supply drinking water to the entire city of New York for a day. The Soviets were very proud. They planned to replicate this model, creating 40 artificial lakes with a total capacity of about 35 billion gallons, equal to 15,000 Olympic swimming pools, or nearly a third of the volume of Lake Tahoe in the U.S., after the explosion, the Soviets knew the world was watching and worried. From Washington to Tokyo, everyone was asking the same question, is Lake Chagan safe? Documentaries were released everywhere confidently claiming, after just 50 days, radiation levels dropped to absolutely safe limits. They published soil and water samples from various spots. The results, according to the media at the time, were within safe limits. The footage was carefully staged, scientists laughing by the lake, people boating and fishing, and especially the Minister of Nuclear Industry Efim Slavsky, almost 70 years old, personally swimming in the supposedly clear and safe water. This was a powerful statement. Look, we're not afraid of radiation. In 1966, newspapers all reported on the beautiful lake in the Kazakh steppe, even encouraging international visitors to come see it. They said radiation levels here are lower than in Moscow, a comparison meant to reassure the public. Technical reports carefully presented numbers to calm people. The measured radiation dose was just a fraction of the danger level. At first, everything looked like the peak of scientific ambition. They not only created a lake, but wanted to prove it could support life. As soon as the water appeared, a biological research station was set up on the shore. Scientists carefully marked fish released 36 species, including piranhas, imported from the Amazon, to test their tolerance. 27 species of mollusks, 32 species of amphibians, 11 reptiles, 8 small mammals, 42 groups of invertebrates, and nearly 150 species of aquatic plants, a highly diverse sample ecosystem. They repeated measurements, water and soil samples, tissue tests, tracking offspring, measuring growth rates, and reproductive ability. At first, propaganda reports described a lake coming back to life, but the scientific reality wasn't so glamorous. Instead of stabilizing, the populations began to decline. Many species died out, those that survived showed clear deformities, birth defects, reproductive disorders, bone malformations, and internal organ abnormalities classic signs of genetic mutations, and teratogenic effects. After a few generations, the cumulative death rate reached about 90% for the species being monitored. Only carp truly adapted, but at a cost. They accumulated radiation at levels even higher than the lake water. In 1974, the Soviet Union quietly ended the project and withdrew all personnel from the area. But it wasn't over. The world was still paying attention, and as creatures started dying, people began to worry about the bigger picture. That's when the truth began to come out.
the most contaminated spot the Adam Cole shore still bears the mark of the experiment. Nearly 60 years later, plutonium-239 was found an isotope with a half-life of about 24,000 years. That means the traces of this explosion will last far longer than any human plan. It sounds impressive if you're a theorist, it's tragic if you're a community. The numbers are even scarier than the slogan's estimates show that thyroid doses in the most contaminated areas exceeded 14 rem over 18 months, about 140 millisieverts in total, or about 14 times a standard CT scan, each CT is about 10 millisieverts. That's almost 100 times the safety limit recommended by the World Health Organization for the public. Do you know who was affected the most? Yes, definitely the workers involved in the project. Many died young, but the exact number, classified documents, secret files, and a blank space in history. And it wasn't just Che Gan. This was just the tip of a program that spanned the whole Soviet Union. From 1971 to 1988, Moscow carried out 124 economic explosions. Under the PNE program, the last one was recorded on September 6, 1988, called Rubin an 8.5 kiloton blast set 28 feet deep to study seismic effects. The program's goals were varied and looked practical on paper, creating reservoirs, diverting water, stimulating oil and gas wells, digging and mining. There were even cases declared successful, for example, near Lake Meozero in Bashkiria. They reported doubling oil output after the explosion. Even when the well ran dry, 15 years later, they set off another blast to keep production going. It sounds like a quick technical fix, but what about the environmental and health costs? It really sounds like putting out a fire with dynamite, doesn't it? Across the ocean, the United States wasn't sitting idle. The Project Plowshare program from 1957 to 1973 carried out 27 explosions with the same ambitions. However, later reports showed that American bombs released more atmospheric radiation, meaning the skies were dirtier even though there were fewer tests. So 124 versus 27, the Soviets won in terms of scale. But does bigger ever mean safer? So what's Lake Chagan like today? Lake Chagan now holds about 4.5 to 5.2 billion gallons of water, about 7,500 to 7,800 Olympic swimming pools. That's enough water to make you think it's a natural lake, but don't forget it's a radioactive lake. The scary part isn't just the total volume, but the water quality reports show radiation levels up to 100 times the legal limit for drinking water. What does that mean for the average person? If you think, just boil it and it'll be fine. Think again, isotopes like plutonium-239 or cesium-137 don't go away by boiling. They stick to the mud, the aquatic plants, and build up in the fish. But what's shocking is that local people still live around this lake. They fish, swim, and even eat carp from the lake, some over three feet long. These fish are thought to still be radioactive, but for poor people in the steppe, they're a rare source of food. The problem isn't just the water. The area with radioactive soil waste within a two to three mile radius has become a secondary source of pollution spreading to the soil, grass, and air. Radiation gets into the food chain water for livestock, meat, and milk, eventually making its way back to humans. So what do you think are these surviving carp, a symbol of nature's adaptation? or a tragic reminder of the atomic age. They wanted to create lakes to support life, but ended up digging graves for generations to come. How about you? What do you think of the dream of peaceful atoms? Can humanity use nuclear energy without leaving scars on the earth? Share your thoughts in the comments below. And if you wanna keep exploring hidden mysteries and unbelievable true stories, from around the world. Don't forget to hit like, subscribe to the channel, and turn on notifications so you don't miss the next episode.